Okay, I think it's 12 o'clock. So thanks for joining me. I'm Katie Wallace, and this is a presentation on how the thyroid gland works. Get my slides forward here, we'll get going. <clears throat> so I'm offering this talk in coordination with the Willie Street Co-op. I offer monthly webinars through the co-op as well as one-on-one -on -one private sessions at the Willie West location and Zoom sessions for members online. So if you're interested in that, it's just $45 to meet with me privately. And I have a few of those slots available every month. Next month, I'm going to be talking about vitamin D, which is applicable to the thyroid gland and every other body system. So I hope you'll join me for that free webinar Wednesday, December 7th. For today's lecture, I would like you to take notes because we're going to spend a lot of time drawing out exactly how the thyroid gland works. And uh, I know a lot of people, their learning style really benefits from actually experiencing and writing things out and drawing them out. So while I'm jabbering on with my intro here, you might grab a pen and paper so that you can retain more of this information. I will be recording it and hopefully we'll be able to send that recording out through my e-newsletter, as well as I list all of the previous webinars I've given on my website. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll circle back around to answering questions at the very end. Um, this talk is for health education reasons only and should not take the place of medical advice. So here we go. I want to really simplify thyroid physiology if such a thing is possible. And that's the whole goal behind this talk. I think um, there's so many different steps and different ways to test the thyroid and different things that interfere with thyroid that it can really help to have a, a comprehensive discussion. Having said that, I mean, we could talk for two or three days about all of the issues related to the thyroid. So for today, we're just gonna zero in and talk about four priorities. So I want you to get an introduction to why thyroid hormones are important. I want you to understand the three big types of stress that will interfere with thyroid health. So if you or someone you love has a thyroid problem, you can begin to understand why, what is the underlying cause so that you can start to address some of those underlying causes. I'm also going to talk about four key steps to how thyroid hormone is balanced and produced. So you have a sense of what is really needed to help support a healthy thyroid gland or to recover from having a thyroid condition. And then we'll kind of do a deeper dive into talking about ways to look at all of the stressors that interfere with thyroid health. How do we test for these things? How do we shift them um, in order to, to have optimal health? So that's where we're going today. So the basic function of thyroid hormones is to go into just about every cell in the body and um, go into the nucleus of those cells and affect the proteins made there. So that affects how does the cell grow, how does it mature, the rate at which it's, it, it grows. Um, thyroid hormones also affect the receptiveness of your cells and your different tissues to other hormones. So it can be very important for serotonin and dopamine. These are neurotransmitters that are important in the nervous system. Also very important for sexual hormones, cortisol, uh, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone. So the thyroid gland um, and the hormones it makes are a big deal. The thyroid gland is located in the throat and you can see it pictured here. It's got a butterfly shape. So the thyroid hormone affects every body system. And um, so there are many, many different signs of an imbalanced thyroid. Uh, I, what I have listed here are some of the common signs of hypo or underactive thyroid, just as an example. And we'll talk more about some of these things throughout our hour today. 
so the thyroid hormone is very important for the digestive system. And so if someone has a thyroid gland that's out of balance, they'll often have digestive symptoms, constipation being a classic one. Uh, depression is very common because a thyroid hormone affects the circulation of neurotransmitters and the metabolism of our, our brain cells. Um, people often experience dry hair, dry skin, or loss of hair. The thyroid has a big role in how we generate proteins and just the basic metabolic rate of the body. So that can have an effect on hair. It obviously affects our energy levels as if it's affecting the growth and the energy level of every cell. Uh, people with thyroid problems often report that they're very sensitive to the cold. Again, their metabolic rate is slower and they're not able to adapt as well to stress. Uh, a goiter is an example of an enlarged thyroid issue um, where the, the thyroid gland is, is actively swelling and expanding. Uh, many people will have trouble losing weight most classically if they have an underactive thyroid. Conversely, if they have hyperactive thyroid, they might have a very quick weight loss um, and, and other symptoms. Um, poor circulation, numbness, uh, everything in the metabolism is slowing down. So we see decreased heart rate, brain fog. We see digestive issues like ulcers, lack of stomach acid, which would lead to problems with absorbing key minerals and nutrients and protein. Uh, we see immune system issues, right? Every system in the body needs thyroid hormone. We see changes in the menstrual cycle. We see muscle cramps at rest because uh, the cells aren't getting the, the hormone they need. And um, a loss of the outer third of the eyebrow is a common sign of underactive thyroid, as well as infertility. So really, uh, this is just a, a picture I snapped out of my thyroid manual. Um, and I just like to demonstrate that the thyroid affects all of these body systems. So if we start with gallbladder function about two o'clock, we know that people who have less thyroid hormone in circulation tend to have more gallbladder problems. We know that liver function and thyroid function are very closely related. The liver actually helps us convert a lot of the thyroid hormone into usable hormone, uh, the T4 to the T3. And um, when we have an unhealthy liver, whether or not we're having trouble detoxifying or we just don't have a good diet um, or um, we've had too much stress and it's used up all that support for the liver, then we see issues with thyroid hormone. To uh, not enough thyroid hormone also will affect cholesterol levels. So we won't excrete thyroid, um, I'm sorry, we won't excrete the cholesterol we need to if we're not making enough thyroid hormone. So people will have high cholesterol levels from having an underactive thyroid. The thyroid also affects protein metabolism, specifically key proteins that are made in the body to help transport things in the bloodstream. Thyroid hormone helps our red blood cells uh, to do what they do best. So it helps with the uptake of vitamins like B12, for example. Uh, the thyroid hormone affects our blood sugar level, and which is the other word is glucose metabolism. Um, and conversely, if we have problems with blood sugar, if we have a lot of blood sugar swings, that's very damaging to the thyroid. So I would say many of the people I initially see who come in with a thyroid issue, their main underlying problem is that they have blood sugar swings. And that's really what's stressing the thyroid. So that can be a very important connection. Thyroid affects the um, steroidogenesis or the formation of our other hormones. So that's where problems with uh, menstrual cycles or fertility come in. Thyroid hormone also affects our bones. How quickly do our bones turn over? How well are we able to build bones? Depends on the thyroid. It affects our cardiovascular system. So our increase for heart attack or stroke in, go up. Um, or sorry, we experience an increase when we don't have enough thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone affects our brain. The, if we have an optimal level of thyroid hormone, then we have increased brain plasticity that helps us be flexible and stay alert and maintain our mental capacity as we're aging. So just some examples of how widespread the thyroid is. 
All right, let's move on to the next section of the talk where we're going to talk about the things that interfere with the thyroid. So any big stressor in the body can create a thyroid problem. So whether or not it's a big physical stress, like um, some sort of physical trauma, some sort of structural issue in the body, surgery, all of those things can interfere with the production of thyroid hormone. Stress, just mental and emotional stress can play a big role in blocking the production of thyroid hormone too. Certain medications will do this. Um, and then the next big thing is basically when the immune system is triggered to uh, fight something, whatever it is, it could be an allergen, it could be a bad microbe in your gut, um, it could be chemicals that you're sensitive to or foods that you're repeatedly eating that don't work well for your body, then the immune system makes something called cytokines, which is written here, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And those are very disruptive to thyroid hormone production. So this is the number one stressor for um, people in America is this immune system-based stress on the thyroid gland. The third thing that really interferes is cortisol. Cortisol is the main stress hormone made in the adrenal glands um, through the coordination of our brain and our pituitary. So if we're sensing a lot of stress, experiencing prolonged stress, then that's uh, very much going to disrupt the performance of the thyroid gland. And we're going to go over all of these things visually in a minute. I want to talk about the four key steps to thyroid function. So you can kind of keep this in mind as I'm drawing out how the thyroid hormone is produced and moved through the body. So the thyroid has to have some key raw materials. It needs raw nutrients. It needs protein in the diet. It needs iodine. We need sodium. We need vitamin D. We need some key things to um, make thyroid hormone and keep, keep making it. We also have what's called a balanced HPA axis. HPA stands for hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal. So this is the axis of glands in our body that respond to stress. And if this system is under too much stress or is out of whack, then the thyroid's not gonna function properly. We need to be able to convert thyroid hormones in the liver and the gut. So it's not just the thyroid gland that's involved in making hormones. It's the um, liver and the gut do a lot of the conversion, which you'll see in a moment. So we have to have a healthy liver and we have to have a healthy gut. And those of you that are experienced in the, this field of natural or functional medicine know that that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, the gut is very complex. And um, if you're a typical American, you're affected by a number of different stressors. But this is very important for the thyroid to keep working on this area. The last area that's very important to thyroid function is actually where it's getting received inside the cell. So there are some key things that your cells have to have in order for the thyroid hormone to work. Things like vitamin A, methyl groups, balanced blood sugar, and I'll talk more about those, okay? So these are the basic things we're gonna cover today. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna draw out this diagram so you have an understanding of these different hormones involved in thyroid production and what they do. I'm gonna stop sharing so um, you might be able to enlarge me as, as a speaker. I'm just hoping that that's um, helpful. Okay, so we're gonna start with the hypothalamus. So if you're drawing on your paper at home, you can make a little circle up in the corner and write um, hypothalamus, HP, HT, okay, hypothalamus. The hypothalamus begins to work on thyroid hormone by making uh, its own hormone called thyrotrophin releasing hormone or TRH. You don't need to remember that lingo, just know the hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary. So I'm gonna make another circle and I'm gonna write pituitary or PIT in it, okay? The hypothalamus has to signal to the pituitary. In order for this to begin to work, we need some basic things for our brain health. 
Both of these glands are glands in the base of our brain. They're our master glands. Um, and we have to have plenty of oxygen. Maybe, you know, I, I know you're all muted, but you could be thinking about what, what else might the hypothalamus need, right? What, what do basic people need to be healthy, for our brain to be healthy? We need food. We need glucose, right? So you've got to have a good balance of blood sugar coming in or some kind of fuel for the brain. And you've got to have movement. That's so why movement is so good for the thyroid gland because it really helps the whole glandular system to operate more efficiently. And so we've got three things. I wrote oxygen, glucose, movement. The fourth thing is thyroid hormone. So actually the this process of making thyroid hormone is a feedback loop where the glands are going to sense how much hormone you made, and that's going to go back to the top. So this will make a little more sense in a minute when we've got the whole picture complete. But just know the thyroid hormone that you've got circulating is getting sensed by these master glands, which are helping to adjust how much more or less you're making. Okay, so the hypothalamus has all these things. It makes the thyrotrophin releasing hormone to signal to the pituitary, and the pituitary in turn makes its own hormone called TSH. Most of you are probably familiar with this if you've ever had or asked to have your thyroid check. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, the standard lab range for thyroid stimulating hormone is, is very large. Um, depending on the lab, it might be 0 0.5 to 4.5 or 5, but that's not really ideal. There's a lot of research showing that using this standard medical range, most people with a thyroid problem are underdiagnosed. So we have a lot of people walking around with a thyroid problem, developing other complications, uh, because this range is very big. The range that I use when I'm talking with people is 1.8 to 3. So if you're in the numbers or want to look back at your numbers, that's an ideal range for somebody um, who, who's not medicated. So we're just trying to look at what would be a healthy baseline. The job of the TSH is to stimulate the thyroid hormone. So I'm going to draw my butterfly-shaped gland, the thyroid gland in the throat. And you need a number of different things to make thyroid hormone in the gland. It needs iodine. So I'm going to write an I. Got to have iodine. You can't make thyroid hormone without iodine. And you need an amino acid called tyrosine. So I'm going to write TY for tyrosine. This is really important. Um, I've had a number of people over the years, I've been practicing for 15 years as a naturopath. A number of people will come to me and say their thyroid's a little underactive. What can they do? They don't really want to go on medication or be on medication forever. And in that type of scenario, just looking at their protein ingestion and increasing their protein intake, making sure there's enough protein available will many times help bring them into an optimal thyroid range. So don't underestimate the value of diet um, for the thyroid. It's very important. Tyrosine is high in things like turkey and chicken and nuts and seeds. The other thing that you need is an enzyme called TPO. So it might be hard for you to see this, but I'm just writing TPO. That's the enzyme that is used to make thyroid hormone. So we've got iodine, we've got protein, and we've got this special enzyme called TPO, which will be important later when we talk about autoimmunity to thyroid, which is the most common problem with the thyroid in the United States. So uh, just a couple peripheral things here that are also important. You've got to have sunlight. Uh, because the action of our brain um, and our body sensing the light helps with making thyroid hormone, particularly red light, the red end of the spectrum. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And vitamin D. Um, so these are very helpful in keeping the thyroid in balance. So I'm just jotting down vitamin D and sunlight. The other thing that's really important is sodium, like sodium from salt that helps with getting the iodine into the thyroid gland. So you don't want to necessarily have a low salt diet, or at least you want to have your sodium level checked by someone like me who can look for an optimal level 
um, if you're concerned about thyroid function. Okay, so that's everything the thyroid gland needs in our simplistic view for today. And it's gonna make two hormones. One is called T4 and one is called T3. So I'm just writing T4 and T3. There are thyroid hormones T1 and T2, but they're not really active in the body. T4 and T3 are the main ones that are active. But just having the thyroid gland make these hormones doesn't make them usable to our cells. We've got to move them through the body and we've got to get them to the cell so that the, they can go into the nucleus. So I'm going to draw a cell. This is going to be like our target cell where all the work of the thyroid hormones goes. Okay. You just imagine it's like a muscle cell, like a cell in your, in your bicep. Okay. So I'm just writing muscle cell. And then I'm going to make a nucleus there. And I'm going to draw, draw a double helix to represent the DNA in the middle of the nucleus. So I want to get this T4 and this T3 to my cells. Right? I want to I want to feel good. I want to get up in the morning. I want to be able to do things. The body transports thyroid hormone on something called thyroid binding globulins. It's just a fancy word for a protein made in the liver that moves the thyroid hormone around. I'm going to draw it so it looks like a little tractor trailer truck. So I'm drawing my truck here. And by the way, this talk was inspired by one of my teachers, Dr. Tom Culleton. I have to credit him with coming up with the tractor trailer truck idea. He's a chiropractor in Texas and teaches a lot of functional medicine classes. So, um, so TBG is thyroid binding globulin. That's actually something you can measure on a test if you want. For most people, we don't need to. And the rate at which your body takes up your um, thyroid hormone, the T3 and the T4, is called T3 uptake. So it's just a percentage for how much of your thyroid hormone is circulating. So maybe some of you have heard of that or wonder what that is. That's all it is. It's a percentage of how much thyroid hormone are you taking up and moving around. So you're going to move it around. You're going to move it to the cell. And then it's going to jump off the truck. And you've got free T3 and free T4, okay, free, F-R-E-E. -E. This is unbound thyroid hormone, which is now available to the cell. We can't just give the cell T3 or T4. That's why when I look at someone's thyroid hormone test, I like to see the free T3 and the free T4, because this tells me the type of thyroid hormone that they're, they're actually using on a cellular level. That hormone is going to do what? I told you earlier what the thyroid hormone does when it goes there, but it's going into the cell. It's going into the nucleus. It's going to help this cell to create and replicate any proteins the cell needs. Anything the cell needs done really is enabled by the thyroid hormone. So in it goes and out come proteins for you know, maturation and growth for the cell. But it's not always that simple. There are some people where their thyroid hormone levels look good, but they, they still feel like they're hypoactive. And in the site, in order for this to work, you need some key things. You need to have plenty of vitamin A. So I'm gonna write vitamin A. And I mean fat soluble vitamin A, not beta carotenoids. You need something called a methyl group. Methyl groups are very abundant in whole foods like eggs and green leafy vegetables. Choline is one of the key nutrients that's a methyl group. I'm just writing methyl group. You need to have a healthy DNA. For some people, there's actually genetic issues, but that's usually not very common. And you have to have balanced blood sugar. So if you have too much insulin, uh, or the person is insulin resistant, this isn't going to work very well either. Okay, so we could just say balanced insulin. 
Insulin is the hormone we make when we take in sugar. Okay, so, so far, you know, it begins in the hypothalamus, which sends a message to the pituitary, which sends this thyroid stimulating hormone signal to the thyroid to make T4 or T3. Those get bound on these proteins. They go to the cell where they jump off in the um, form of the free hormone. They go into the cell. If you've got adequate vitamin A, methyl groups, balanced blood sugar, wham, your cells are gonna get what they need. So I wanna back up a minute and talk a little bit about TSH because this is the most common test ordered when someone's looking at their thyroid hormone. But you know now it's not even a thyroid hormone. It's a, it's a pituitary hormone, right? So you have to keep that in mind and realize you're gonna be missing part of the picture if you're trying to figure out what's going on just by looking at TSH because all you know is what the pituitary is sensing. The pituitary will make more TSH when there's not enough thyroid hormone in production. And this usually is initially confusing to someone looking at this number because TSH will actually be higher when the thyroid hormone is lower. So if someone has low thyroid function, they will have a high TSH. If they have too much thyroid hormone, the TSH is going to be letting up a little bit. It's going to be kind of putting the brakes on the thyroid hormone. So that's how most doctors will interpret TSH. Um, if it's right in the middle and it looks good, then we just assume thyroid hormone is good. That's not always the case. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but I just wanted you to have a sense for how to interpret the TSH and why it seems a little backwards when you first um, are introduced to this number. Now I want to talk more about T4 and T3. Okay, so we have these two types of thyroid hormone. T4 is ho-hum. T4 goes into the cell. It's gonna get the job done. Yeah, the cell is gonna kind of grow and mature, but T3 is really robust. It's really going to get the job done. The cell's going to get what it's need. Bam. It's like, really powerful. The body only makes 6% of thyroid hormone into T3. 94% of the thyroid hormone we make is T4. And you might be asking yourself, why is that? You just said T3 is like so much more powerful and does all this good stuff. Well, we think the body does this as a safety mechanism because if you get too much T3, that's a big problem. You could, you know, T3 controls the metabolic rate of your body. It controls the metabolic rate of your heart. If your heart is getting too much fuel and it's going too fast, you're gonna have a heart attack. It, um, so we think that the body only makes a little bit of T3 and then in the liver and the gut, it manages the rest of the amount of T3 it's gonna give you so that it can keep you in balance. So you can think of the T3 production as like a natural safety valve in the body so that you don't overdo it. And that's an important thing to keep in mind if you're taking thyroid hormone, either in a supplemental over-the-counter form or as a prescription, that it's dangerous to take too much. That's why you want to be measuring and working with someone who has experience so you don't have a problem. And it's not very common for people to have problems, but it's important to know. So next we're gonna talk about this conversion. I'm gonna draw a liver. So there's my liver, and then I'm gonna draw a gut. I'm just gonna draw a big circle for the gut. And I'm gonna label it gut, and I'm gonna label this liver. Because this is really important, because if you want to have optimal health, you want to have adequate T3 levels, and it depends on your liver and your gut health. So the first pathway of conversion from T4 to T3 happens about 60% of the time, and it uses an enzyme called 5' prime deiodinase. I'm just going to write uh, 5' prime DIO here. You don't need to know how to spell that. Um, just know that this, uh, there's a special enzyme because that's important when we start to think about what impacts thyroid hormone production, because a lot of things will mess with this enzyme and then someone's not getting the thyroid hormone that they need. 
So um, what is important for this pathway to work is to have enough iron. So if you're low in iron, if you're anemic, or if you tend to eat a vegetarian diet and don't stay on top of your iron issues, this pathway is not going to work very well. Um, and the person's going to have problems with thyroid hormone. So iron is very important. Another mineral that's very important is selenium. Selenium is very high in um, meat, different types of meats, as well as Brazil nuts. Some of you have probably heard that. You also need serotonin and dopamine. So these are two neurotransmitters. I'm just writing serotonin and dopamine. So someone who is experiencing a lot of mental health stress or has gut stress, which impacts their serotonin and dopamine is gonna have problems with thyroid hormone. They're not gonna be able to convert enough T4 to T3 and they're just, they're gonna, their body's just gonna be kind of ho-hum. It's, it's not really gonna be great. They're not really gonna respond to stress as well as they remember responding to stress in the past, perhaps. There's a couple other pathways for T4 to T3 conversion. I'll go through them quickly. T4 can be bound up in something called reverse T3. Reverse T3, uh, this is a way to bind up extra thyroid hormone in case the body needs to do that. Like an example would be uh, when a woman is pregnant, we see reverse T3 levels elevate. Um, the body's tying up any extra thyroid hormone that may be circulating from the fetus or as a result of the pregnancy, um, it, it's tying that up. Um, and, and then the last pathway is called um, T4 to T3 acetate and sulfate. Acetate, like acetic acid, and T3 sulfate, like sulfur. And that's basically because when this pathway, this T3, we take the T4 um, and in the liver, we end up with T3 acetate and T3 sulfate that can go to the gut. And if the gut environment is healthy, if we have um, enough sulfur available in the diet, sulfur comes in the forms of like the onion family, um, uh, the, the brassica family, the cruciferous vegetables, um, and we have the right acidity and the right good bacteria in our gut, then we can convert this T3 acetate, T3 sulfate to T3. So it's just another way to make more T3. So basically, you have a healthy gut, you're going to be able to make more T3, which is the good stuff that your cells want. And using the thyroid binding globulin tractor trailer truck, you know, I can move this around the body to the cell. Okay. So we've covered the, the basic uh, thyroid physiology that I wanted to talk about today. I'm just going to review it real quick before we go on. It begins in the hypothalamus, in the presence of oxygen, healthy food, movement, thyroid hormone. We make thyrotrophin uh, releasing hormone, which sends a message to the pituitary to make TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. That tells the thyroid gland to make some hormone out of iodine, tyrosine, which is from protein, and the TPO enzyme. We make two types of thyroid hormone that are usable, T4 and T3. If you want to know how much your cells are actually getting, you want to measure free T3 and free T4, because that's what's actually going into the cells. And then the body... Um, really benefits from the T3, but it only makes a little bit of it. And then it manages making more T3 for you in your liver. So if you've got a healthy liver and a healthy gut, and you've got iron, selenium, balanced dopamine, balanced serotonin levels, you're going to be able to convert all the T3 you need. Um, and during other times, maybe you have too much thyroid hormone, your body can tie it up into something called reverse T3. Incidentally, if you're under a lot of stress and you have high cortisol levels, that oftentimes leads someone to tie up more hormone into reverse T3. Um, so sometimes that's checked. Uh, and then we have a third pathway, the T3 acetate, T3 sulfur, where the liver will take the T4 made from the thyroid gland and uh, convert it in the gut to more usable T3. That all goes to the cell. Every cell in the body just about needs thyroid hormone. 
It's going to go into the nucleus of the cell so that that cell can make whatever proteins it needs to grow and mature and be healthy. Um, but you've got to have enough vitamin A, you've got to have methyl groups, and you've got to have um, healthy DNA and healthy blood sugar control for that to happen. Okay, so you just learned all of that in like the last, I don't know, however many minutes. So now I want to talk about the um, things that interfere with thyroid physiology now that you kind of have starting to have a basic idea of how this works. Okay, so I said any kind of stress, any kind of physical trauma could affect the thyroid. And, and that makes sense if we're talking about the hypothalamus here and the pituitary's involvement. These organs are sensing the level of stress. And if they're under too much strain, then um, the, the thyroid gland's not gonna get the messaging it needs. Cortisol is the main stress hormone and it can interfere in multiple st steps. So um, cortisol very much, I'm just gonna write a CO for cortisol, can affect the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Cortisol also can affect the conversion of T3 in the gut through this five prime diiodinase pathway and the first pathway of T4 to T3 conversion. Cortisol also can thin the gut lining and impair gut health. So we can have a big hit to our T3 production in the gut that way. Also a big way to interfere with thyroid physiology and the most common one for Americans is through the pro-inflammatory cytokine production. Those are the chemicals made by the immune system. So if you've got a big allergen, if you're eating a food that's not good for you, uh, you know, that's aggravating your immune system, if um, you have toxins in your body or you have an imbalance in the bacteria in your gut, or if you just have higher insulin levels, you're slowly getting insulin, more insulin resistant with time, like most adults in America, then you're making a lot more pro-inflammatory cytokine chemicals. And those are gonna interfere with um, the HPA axis here. They're gonna interfere with thyroid hormone. They're gonna interfere with thyroid conversion. They're gonna interfere with gut production. So you can see how if you've got some inflammation in your body from immune system aggravation, the thyroid gland is very quickly going to respond and it's not necessarily gonna be good. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, Hang on a sec, I'll try to get to where I um, left off. There we go. Okay. Okay, so the thyroid gland needs some raw materials. You should begin to have a sense of what those are. It needs a healthy HPA axis. That means we have to have a healthy stress response and enough support for our stress response. It needs to have healthy conversion in the liver and the gut, and it needs to have healthy receptor sites and all the things that support reception in the cell getting the thyroid hormone. Oh, I mentioned it also needs sunlight. So this is a cool study where they took people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the autoimmune driven thyroid disease, and they exposed them to red light therapy. So the red light is the end of the spectrum of the sunlight um, that is most prominent at sunrise and sunset. Um, but you can um, make artificial red light, and people do, and um, just sit in front of the red light and have the red light, you know, you're looking at it, but also your body is having the right red light shining on it. They did this in a study and they found that the majority of the participants were able to get off of their thyroid hormone medication using red light therapy. So light, sunlight, a healthy light environment, which is the opposite of what most people experience in our indoor artificial environments, very critical for thyroid health. And I'm just gonna emphasize again, if you're just measuring TSH, look how much you're missing. This is why a lot of people say, yeah, you know, I, I got my thyroid diagnosed or I'm taking medication, but I still don't feel good. Uh, it's because all these other things could be happening. And if you're only measuring one piece of the puzzle, you're probably missing the boat. 
So there's many different patterns of thyroid dysfunction, and I'll just go through them so you can begin to see how complex it can be. I mean, it, it's really like you don't have to be a genius to figure this out, but you need to realize that there's all these different steps and all these different patterns, and they require a different approach. So um, hypothyroidism is the one people are most commonly aware of. A standard hypothyroidism is where the thyroid is simply not getting enough iodine. And this is most common in the rest of the world. It's not as common in America. In America, the most common form of hypothyroidism is autoimmune. So that means that there's cytokine production from the diet, something bothering the person in their environment, poor lifestyle, um, and that is just generating too much stress for the thyroid gland. Hyperthyroidism is where the thyroid produces too much hormone. And of course, that can be very dangerous for the body. That is an autoimmune driven process too. So again, you've got to think about how do you support the HPA axis? How do you support the person's immune system? What is bothering their immune system? And if you can address those things, then they will go into remission. The third form is called primary pituitary with suboptimal thyroid function. So basically this means the problem's not the thyroid, the problem is the pituitary. So in this person, their TSH will look suboptimal, it'll look a little low, but their thyroid hormone levels will be fine. This is a very common sign of HPA axis stress. They're stressed to their adrenals, they're stressed to their pituitary and their hypothalamus. And so you would address that very differently than you would address a thyroid problem. The thyroid's fine. It's the upstream things that are the problem in that case. The fourth pattern is under conversion, meaning that the person cannot convert from T4 to T3. So they're just not feeling great. Um, maybe their T4 levels are fine, but their T3 levels are not at all fine. And they have a lot of health problems because of that. So here you're looking at converting in the liver and the gut and supporting them with T3 hormone. There is such a thing as overconversion. This usually happens when someone has an infection or exposure to toxins or medicines. And also sometimes everybody's uh, or the person's thyroid hormone level looks okay, but they're still not feeling like they get enough thyroid hormone because they have an estrogen or a testosterone imbalance. And then finally, the last pattern would be where there's receptor site resistance to the cell. Again, their thyroid hormone levels all look good. Maybe they were initially diagnosed and they're given um, a medication, but they still don't feel good. That's because it's not getting into the cell and they need to work on the things in the receptor site to improve it. So vitamin A, methylation, they need to overcome insulin resistance. All right. So here's a review of the raw materials needed. We need tyrosine-rich foods. We need iodide. The best way to get iodine, we convert it to iodide, is seafood and fish in the diet and things like seaweed from the ocean. That's because our soils used to be rich in iodine and it all got washed down into the oceans over time, basically. And so if you eat things from the oceans, um, you will be able to get this mineral. We also need adequate sodium. A good way to test this is to look at a comprehensive metabolic panel. That's a standard blood test that you can get. It's like $15 to order the test through someone like myself, or you can ask your doctor to order it. Um, we can begin to dial in some of these mineral levels and see how you're doing. Iron is very important. So this is typically tested in what's called a ferritin test, which tests your iron stores. Iron is also, um, you, you can sometimes gauge it from looking at someone's hematocrit and hemoglobin. Selenium is a little harder to test. It's not commonly tossed, tested with medical doctors. I can test it in something called a micronutrient panel. It does a good job at looking at all the important trace minerals. Um, but if there's a conversion problem, I'm gonna suggest putting someone on selenium, even if I don't have a test for selenium. Zinc is very important too, actually. I didn't add that here, but that can be really helpful in the thyroid hormone conversion as well. 
Um, you've got to have the methyl donors. I talked about some of those good foods like eggs and green leafy vegetables. You've got to have fat soluble vitamin A. So that's going to come from eating fish and seafood, whole dairy, um, um, animal products that are from pastured animals um, are a good way to get vitamin A. And then vitamin D, you of course get in the sunshine. That's the best way to get it. We don't get enough sunshine to optimize our levels here in Wisconsin. So there's different ways to work around that. And I'll talk about that in next month's webinar. You also need healthy levels of serotonin and dopamine. Those rely on iron, okay? If you're low in iron, you're not gonna have healthy serotonin or dopamine levels because you just can't physically make them. You also have to have a healthy gut. Most of the serotonin in the body is made in the gut. Um, so that's where that healthy gut biome comes in with creating the gut chemistry needed to make some extra help with the extra T3 conversion. Um, and proper stomach acid is very important. That's something that I talk about in another webinar, but as we age, our stomach acid levels go down. So we always wanna be working on proper stomach acid levels. That helps with creating the right pH environment for the gut conversion to happen and the right signaling for the liver. So the liver is well supported. You gotta have exercise, right? Exercise helps with um, the HBA axis and helps with stimulating the thyroid gland. Um, it's also very important for keeping serotonin and dopamine in balance. Um, so many, many raw materials, as you now understand. I want to spend a minute talking about autoimmune thyroid since it's so common in the U.S. Like I said, the most uh, uh, autoimmune hypothyroidism is the most common form of thyroid problem in the U.S. So for that, you want to check the TPO antibody, which is what's listed here as TPO AB. And you just want it to be in the lab normal range. Oh, I forgot to give you the other ranges here. Why don't I do that before we move on? If you want to look at your thyroid hormone tests, an optimal T3 level is going to be three to four, and an optimal T4 is going to be 1.0 to two. And you got the TSH there. Um, and then we want the TPO antibody to be lab normal. Those are the basic tests that I run with just about every person I see, if possible, because um, it gives us a very good screening of whether or not thyroid hormone is, is healthy or not. And I didn't say whether or not it's lab normal or not. I really want it to be optimal because um, thyroid hormone, as you know, it goes in every cell in the body. So if a person has a problem, they have a chronic health problem or something they're working on, they're not going to get better if the thyroid hormone is, is not optimal. And so it's one of those things like vitamin D and being able to oxygenate your blood with iron, B12, and folate, and having healthy blood sugar control. If you don't have all those things dialed in, you're just going to be searching from thing to thing to thing, trying to figure out how to get better. Anyway, for the thyroid hormone, uh, or for the thyroid antibody, this is testing the, for the antibody that targets the TPO enzyme. Remember I said this is really important for making thyroid hormone. So people with autoimmune tendencies tend to begin to make an antibody that targets this enzyme. And different scientists have looked at why that is. Some of the theories are that it, um, the structure of this enzyme looks very similar to other things the body is fighting. So if a person has a gluten sensitivity, for example, they'll have some antibodies to thyroid um, because it looks very similar. It's called, it's a field called molecular mimicry. Um, the other very common thing underlying this besides a gluten sensitivity is that the autoimmune activity will be perpetuated by an H. pylori infection. H. pylori is a bacteria that's in the digestive system that causes a lot of issues. Um, and you sometimes need a very sensitive test, a sensitive stool test to identify whether or not it's there. But I find more often than not, someone with Hashimoto's tests positive when I test them for H. pylori and um, they need to be treated uh, in order to help reverse the autoimmune tendencies. The other thing that really helps with the elevated TPO antibody is to eat a very clean diet. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
The second type of antibody that can be commonly tested is called a thyroglobulin antibody. This tests positive in people with hyperthyroidism more commonly, but basically thyroglobulin is a protein in the thyroid gland that's used to make the thyroid hormone. Um, and so if you have an uh, antibody to that, then you can't um, you can't control the thyroid hormone production as well. Same for the TPO antibody. If your body's attacking this pathway to making thyroid hormone, then your management of thyroid hormone production is going to be skewed. All right, I think we covered this. Hopefully you guys can say, yes, I got this. Stress impacts the thyroid. Cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines from immune system triggers impact the thyroid. And stress hormone cortisol impacts the thyroid. You see how these things impact the gut. They impact the liver. They impact the thyroid hormone. They impact the HPA axis. So we'll talk in a minute about how to identify some of these underlying causes for thyroid immune um, aggravation, but sometimes you're just, my job is to help someone manage. And these are an example of remedies that can help manage the inflammation and the immune aggravation that's already occurring. Turmeric, resveratrol, these are both plant-based extracts. Liposomal glutathione is an antioxidant made in the liver. Well, the glutathione is an antioxidant made in the liver. Liposomal glutathione is a, a supplemental form. And NAC and acetylcysteine is another supplement that helps recycle glutathione. So it's basically giving the body a lot of antioxidants to help quench all this aggravation from the immune system. And that helps a lot with normalizing the thyroid hormone production. You wanna have plenty of vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important in managing the immune response and calming an overaggressive immune system. And you wanna have plenty of DHA. DHA is an omega-3 fatty acid that comes from eating fish. The best way to increase your omega-3s in your body is to eat more fish to the tune of eating it four to five times a week. Um, taking fish oil does not have the same effect. Studies show us taking fish oil doesn't have the same effect of raising the DHA in our bodies the way that we might optimally want to. You can still take a fish oil if for some reason eating fish is not accessible to you or you just find fish oil helps, that's great, but it's always best to eat the food. The GI map is a stool test that I like to order to help identify what's going on in the gut. And this often tells me about what could be aggravating the liver too, if we're worried about um, these um, areas of health in connection to the thyroid. <clears throat> this is how I would identify if there's an H. pylori issue for someone. I often find people that I'm working with test negative when they test with their doctor for H. pylori because it's not a very sensitive test. This test, when we do the stool test, it's very sensitive. It's counting every cell in the stool and looking at its DNA. So it's much more sensitive than a lot of tests out there. I find the information is always very relevant. I've never been sorry that I ordered it for someone. And it's very comprehensive. It's gonna tell us, is there a gluten sensitivity? Does the person have leaky gut? Uh, do they have trouble digesting um, fat? What is the immune response in the gut? Is their immune system exhausted? You know, what's going on? Is there inflammation? It's going to answer all those questions. So it's a great way to get to understanding some of the root causes for thyroid problems. If we're thinking about T4 to T3 conversion, then we need all of these precursors for the 5' prime diiodinase pathway, the selenium, the iron, the serotonin, and the dopamine. You got to have plenty of glutathione and NAC on board to help support the liver, um, healthy uh, bacteria in the gut. So sometimes we need to do probiotics or other therapies for the gut and a lot of liver support, including sulfur-based foods or even something like Epsom salt baths to help get enough sulfur into the body for these processes and conversion. Bitter herbs can help also for supporting the liver and the gut. A lot of times someone has leaky gut and so their T3 levels overall are subpar because of a gut issue. I have a whole nother webinar on leaky gut, but very quickly it is where the gut becomes hyperpermeable or 
too easy for things to get through. And you can see in the bottom of my slide here how food particles and things will be getting into the bloodstream where there will be a massive cytokine production um, of these pro-inflammatory chemicals that are going to go throughout the body and inter interrupt healthy physiology for the person and lead to autoimmune problems. So one of the big things to keep in mind is reducing inflammation to the diet because this will help with leaky gut. This will provide a lot of the key nutrients needed for the thyroid and for the uh, liver. So I'm a big fan of the paleo diet, which has an emphasis on a lot of healthy plant-based foods, vegetables. Um, the paleo diet does not include any grains like rice or quinoa or gluten. And it does have an emphasis on quality proteins like grass-fed bison and wild fish, as well as quality fats. You want to avoid these top six allergens. These are the key uh, or the most common immune system aggravators. So if there is a food trigger that's interrupting physiology, it's most commonly gluten, sugar, dairy, corn, soy, or peanut. And I talk more about these in the leaky gut webinar if you want to check that out on my website. And we do a, a program for leaky gut recovery. In the interest of time, I've got a... Um, scoot through this. So to summarize, if you want to support your thyroid, you've got to make sure you're covering all the raw materials needed. And you want to check enough numbers to know what's going on, not just TSH. You may need to dig a little further than that. You may need to do a stool test or some other testing to identify different bacteria or fungus or bugs in your gut. You may need to eliminate or test for food sensitivities. You may need to evaluate for different toxins like mold toxins or heavy metals. And you may need to test your HBA axis by doing some adrenal hormone testing. I wrote a book, it's called The Body Tune-Up. I just released it this last year. You can get it on my website or it, it's also available in an ebook on Amazon. And in the book, I talk about a food-based approach to help reducing the autoimmune activity that leads to most common thyroid problems and just the general dietary approach that I'm promoting here um, for getting those raw materials for the thyroid gland. So feel free to check that out. This is a picture of one of the test kits I often use that tests for food sensitivities. I like this KBMO test because it's just a pinprick from the finger and it incorporates testing for antibodies to food as well as um, other forms of cellular stress from food. I really advocate if you don't have someone like myself doing functional blood work analysis for you that you should because we will look at your blood work in a way that's much more in depth than most medical doctors will. And you'll come out with a lot of nutritional um, information on how to improve your health. Um, this is an example of a kit that you use. It's a saliva test kit to test for cortisol levels. This is the, sort of the last thing I'm gonna cover here just in a couple minutes. It can be really helpful to understand your stress hormone pattern. You can see in this picture, ideal stress hormones are gonna be in a nice downhill ski slope. And you can see the person who did the testing here, they have that blue line. You can see how high and out of range their cortisol is. And then you can begin to think about if your cortisol was out of the range like that all the time, how it's going to disrupt um, all, of, all of the cells in your body through intercepting thyroid hormone. So it can be really helpful sometimes to test and see where your level is. A lot of people have dysfunctional cortisol levels just from poor diet. They're eating and drinking stimulants or high carbohydrate foods that are getting them on a blood sugar roller coaster, which is leading to dysregulation of cortisol. So those two things are very closely related. <clears throat> sometimes people just need more dietary support or more help with stress management. These are some herbs that are often used to help with cortisol management. These are some other supplements that help with managing the cortisol response as well. So I'll ask you, now that you have seen the whole talk, if you think just getting a T4 medication 
would necessarily be adequate for most people for helping with their thyroid hormone? And the answer is no, of course not. I mean, if you want to look holistically at this problem and really get to the root cause, you've got to think about the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenals. You got to think about conversion, supporting the liver and the gut. You've got to think about all of the key nutrients needed for receiving the hormone. You've got to reduce immune stress and stressors overall and help balance the stress hormone levels in your body. So these would be, you know, this is basically my solution. This is just it in different words. You got to, um, for most people doing a dietary upgrade, taking targeted supplements that are individualized for them, and then helping identify and work on some of those underlying problems is really the solution to overcoming a thyroid problem. So this is just one last plug that I offer those $45 sessions at the Willie Street Co-op. I think I'm full for November, but I do have sessions available in December. And you can make an appointment with me privately as well. Um, that's just available through human nature. And I hope to see you all next month talking about vitamin D and sunlight. And thank you so much.